Have you ever had a day that just changed everything? A day that you mark time by? A day that you consider this is what life was like before this day, this is what life is like after this day? Sometimes generationally we have those, those days. I can remember being in English class, I was in grammar school, and I can remember that my English teacher was diagramming a sentence on the chalkboard and she was in the middle of of diagramming the sentence. And if you're familiar with how that used to be, um, she's making these marks and showing where the noun goes in a verb. And and over the, the speaker system, the principal of our school uh, chimes in and gives us the news uh, that the space shuttle Challenger had exploded. And I can remember that day very vividly. My teacher had her back to us and her um, face was at the chalkboard and she just stayed there for what seemed like you know, several minutes. I'm sure it was just 30 seconds or so, but she didn't even turn around. She just sort of just sat down in her seat and stayed there again and didn't move. Eventually she turned around and started to talk to us about what had just occurred. And that day sticks in my mind because it was a day where I was young enough to where my world was pretty much just confined to my backyard, you know, and, and I remember that as we discussed the events that happened that day, and if you could remember that day, uh, a teacher was up there. So it was very, it was very impactful to, to my teacher, I'm sure to several teachers during that time period. And that was a day where my world kind of opened up a bit. It wasn't just about me and my backyard and just the few people within my community that I, that I knew, but it was, it gave me a, a bit of a global perspective. Um, another day, you know, that comes to my mind was, was Tuesday, September 11th, 2001. I can remember I, we had just, Tammy and I had just moved into a new house. Um, we had boxes that were all over the place. We had a busy summer. We started at a new church and a new ministry and it was filled with camps and mission trips. And we had yet really to unbox and unload some of these things that we had just kind of stuck in our living room. So I actually took the day off and I was watching the Today Show, and in the middle of unpacking a box, uh, you know, the interruption came and, and told of what happened. And there was confusion. And I remember, I remember where I was, you know, on that particular day. Unless you go through something like that, if you were born after that event, or if you were not, if you were young enough, you can't really remember that, right? You can't, you can't really relate. I can't relate to, to people that say, I remember where I was when Kennedy was shot. I was born years after that. And I can remember as a young high school guy, um, hearing people talk about where they were, you know, during Pearl Harbor. I can't relate to that. But I think generally, generationally, I think every single generation has those particular days where at times you just sort of mark time. This was a, what life was like before, and this is what life is like afterwards. And not just generationally, gener generationally or, or corporately, but then there's those days individually, those days where you receive a phone call and there's an accident and, and it changes your life forever, or you receive that phone call from a doctor that you had some tests and the tests don't come back you know, positive, um, that's, there's negative news. I mean, those days, the birth of a child, you know, is a, is a day where you mark time. This is, this is what life was like before, this is what life is like now. I'm going to talk about here as we're going to be celebrating Resurrection Sunday in just a couple of days, and maybe you're actually watching this on Easter, um, about a particular day that changed the life of a couple of individuals. Many of you are sure, I'm sure, are familiar with this passage of scripture. Uh, two individuals, we only have one of their names. Um, they're traveling to a town, and the town is Emmaus. The scripture tells us it's in the Gospel of Luke. Luke is the only gospel that, that shares this particular account, account. And along this road, Jesus comes alongside of them. They don't recognize him for who he is. This is on Resurrection Sunday. He has already appeared to, 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 to Mary Magdalene, and, and he has already risen from the grave. But they had received news of the empty tomb, but they had not necessarily believed the report of the resurrected Jesus. They just knew the tomb was empty. They just knew that they had news shared to them from some people that they weren't quite ready yet to buy what they were hearing. And yet Jesus met them on the road. He 
conceals himself for a little while, but then eventually reveals to them that he is Jesus. He's resurrected and it changed, it changed their life forever. We only find this account in the Gospel of Luke. And if you're familiar with the Gospel of Luke, Luke is originally written to one particular guy, a guy by the name of Theophilus. Dr. Luke was a companion of the Apostle Paul, and maybe Luke met Theophilus. He's obviously a Greek. That's a Greek name. Maybe on perhaps one of the journeys that he accompanied Paul with. He was Paul's personal physician. For whatever the reason or however however they met, um, this relationship developed, Luke and Theophilus. And so Luke, right out in chapter one, just tells us why he's writing this account, this orderly account that he talks about so that Theophilus can have as much information as he possibly can so that he can make an informed decision about who Jesus is. And because Luke is a, a doctor and because of who Luke is talking to, a lot of the familiar scenes that we see that Luke shares with the other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and, and John, there are these sort of behind-the-scenes angles that you see within these passages, these familiar passages that a Greek mind, a, a philosophical mind, would have, would have been really gravitating toward. And so we see this in the Gospel of Luke. Luke also is incredible in terms of detail. And yet, surprisingly... Here in this description of these two individuals that are traveling to this road, we actually don't have a whole lot of detail. We don't know why they're traveling to this particular place. Uh, Emmaus really is an unmentioned town, and except for here in this passage of scripture. We don't know if we're assuming this was their, their hometown. Um, there are two individuals that are traveling. We only have one of their names and not even really who they are, what relationship that they have with perhaps the disciples or the women that went to the tomb. They have knowledge of what happened, and they may have ventured into those circles. They may have followed Jesus from afar, but yet they, they weren't part of that inner circle. And so Luke actually leaves details out, and many people believe this is intentional because as he's writing, to his friend Theophilus, whose the purpose is to give him as much information as he possibly can and concerning the life and, the, and the, the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus and his teachings and his miracles and his healings and his interactions with people. And then, and then the unnamed person that we have in this account, it's almost like Luke is saying, okay, Theophilus, I've given you all of this information. Insert your name here. The person that we don't mention, the one that is not given a name, maybe that was intentional. In fact, many people believe that this Emmaus Road account, and we're going to read it here in just a moment, was really a summary, a summary of the purpose of why Luke was writing to his friend. This information is given. What will you do when you are confronted with the resurrected Jesus? Insert your name here. So what we're going to do here today is we're just going to walk through some observations and some applications. But before we do that, I encourage you, if you have your scriptures with you, if not, you can pause me, and get them handy. Um, turn to Luke chapter 24. I'll begin reading here on at verse 13. Now the same day, the two of them, we don't have their names yet, but we know there are two. We're going to a village called Emmaus about seven miles from Jerusalem. Here, actually, Luke does give us a detail. It would have taken about a five-hour you know, span of time to get to this place. It's outside of Jerusalem. They were talking to each other about everything that had happened, and so they had witnessed the, the crucifixion and the events leading up to this. As they traveled and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. So here it's Jesus, he's coming alongside of them, but they don't see him for who he is. It's a supernatural keeping from, recogn from recognition. And he asked them, this is verse 17, what are you discussing together as you walk along this road? And they stood still and their faces downcast. And one of them named Cleopas, and we actually have this person's name, but that's it. We don't know what the relation is. We don't know if he's a person of significance. Some people think that it might have been 
um, Jesus's uncle, Joseph's brother. But yet that doesn't make sense because Jesus was from the Galilee area. And if this is their home, Emmaus, seven miles outside of Jerusalem, it just didn't seem likely. So he's just a name. He says, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here these days? What things? Jesus asked. Jesus is kind of playing a little country dumb here, obviously. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. Now that is a description of Jesus, and it's not incorrect. It's just not complete. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, on the third day, this is the third day since it all took place. Jewish thought at the time would have believed that the spirit left the body after the third day. In addition, some of our women amazed us, and they went to the tomb early in the morning. And this is the day where that happened. It was later on, obviously, during that day but didn't find his body. They came and told us what they had seen. Uh, they had seen a vision of angels, which was not incorrect, just not quite complete, who said that he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. And he said to them, this is Jesus, inserting truth here in verse 25. How foolish you are. And this wasn't so much of a rebuke. This was really a word that says how, how uninformed you are, how misconstrued you have the facts here, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses, and that's the law, you know, the first five books of what we call the Old Testament and the prophets, that's really the last third of the Old Testament. He explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself, and yet they still don't see him. As they approached the village to where they were going, it's assuming this is their hometown, Jesus continued on as if he was going to go farther. But they urged him strongly, stay here with us for it is nearly evening and the day is almost over. And so he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they saw him, and they recognized him, and he disappeared then from their sight. And they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us when he talked to us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? And they got up and they returned at once to Jerusalem and there they found the 11 and those with them assembled together and they said, it is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. And then the two told what had happened to them along the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Now, you've probably heard this passage of scripture. I actually find it very interesting that you know over the years that I've been in ministry, uh, sometimes I look back and, um, you know, I taught or done a Bible study or preached on a particular passage of Scripture. And yet, as I look back over my over my notes and my files, it was just shocking. I, have, I actually have never commented or taught on this passage of Scripture. And yet, as a very familiar passage of Scripture, the road to Emmaus, this day that changed the lives of these two individuals forever. And there's some incredible truths some incredible observations that we're going to make here and some incredible applications. And so with the time that we have remaining, I just want to go through a few. Here's number one. What we see here in this passage of Scripture is that Jesus, they affirmed what they were feeling. You can affirm what a person is feeling and not affirm their conclusion that they come to. You can affirm what a person is going through and not necessarily affirm the behavior that stems from that. Sometimes we, we get that messed up that if we, if we affirm what a person is feeling, that means that we are affirming their choices or their behavior or their lifestyle. We see something so important that Jesus comes alongside of them in their journey. And the reason why is because that's where people are. And Jesus continues to come alongside people in their journey. 
And in this passage of scripture, what we see is actually even Jesus allows incomplete information about what has happened to be communicated because at this point of the journey, he's just interested in listening. And they share their, their hopes and how they had hoped that Jesus of Nazareth was going to be the one that was promised and he was going to redeem Israel. And they're thinking physically, a physical kingdom and, and kicking out the Romans and, and establishing Israel as independent and sovereign. And, and yet they crucified Jesus. They're, they're desperate. They're depressed. They're in despair. And Jesus comes alongside of them. They don't see him for who he is because sometimes our hopelessness and our helplessness and our despair can keep us from seeing the truth. And yet Jesus comes alongside anyway, doesn't he? I think the word that comes to my mind here is, is feelings. Jesus cares about what people are feeling and he listens. And here they are, Jesus is giving them an opportunity to cry out and express their disappointments, their discouragements, their hopes, and how their hopes had not come to fruition. Jesus comes alongside of them. And for a certain amount of time during this journey, Jesus just simply listens. Now, Jesus eventually interjects because there's only so long that you can just vent and cry out and talk about your feelings and not cross over to wallowing in despair. Jesus never allows them to go past that point. But Jesus does come alongside them. And for a period of time, and we don't know how long this was, Jesus just allows them to share what they're feeling. Now, eventually, Jesus does get, get to some information. And that actually leads us to number two. And, you know, Jesus gives them information about what they did not understand. You see, the first part of their journey was about what they were feeling. The next part of their journey is about the facts that they were missing. You see, Jesus never calls anyone to commitment until he gives them information. You know, sometimes we watch maybe perhaps films of the life of Jesus and we see that Jesus comes up to some fisherman in a boat and it seems like he doesn't have any relationship with them whatsoever and just simply says follow me and they just look at him with a really dumb look on their face and they just drop their nets and they follow that that's not an accurate picture of what was going on Jesus always gave people information before he called them to commitment Sometimes the information that was given was about his power and miracles and the, the ability to cast out demons from people or the power of his teaching. And, but Jesus always gave people information before he calls them to commitment. And we actually see this, don't we, in this passage of Scripture. In fact, the passage of Scripture says that after Jesus asks them questions and allows them to express their feelings and they talk about how their hopes have been dashed because they believe that Jesus was the one who is going to redeem Israel, and Jesus allows them to express their feelings. He doesn't allow them to cross over to wallowing in despair because this is what he says. He says, okay, how foolish you are. Now, I don't believe this was a harsh statement. I believe this was a statement where Jesus is just saying, you're, you're not seeing the facts correctly. You're, you're seeing them through the lens of the hopes that were dashed. You, you're seeing them through the lens of disappointment. You're seeing the facts through the lens of despair. And it is, it is skewing your perception. I've allowed you to share your feelings. Allow me to share some facts. And here is Jesus is what he says. He says, how foolish you are and slow to believe and all the prophets that have, that have spoken. Did not the Messiah need to, to suffer in these things and then to enter into his glory? And then verse 27 says, beginning with Moses. I mean, that's the first five books of the Old Testament. I'm sure it was a summary, obviously. But he explains the Messiah within the writings of Moses. And then all the prophets, the, the last third of what we would call the Old Testament, Jesus points out this is all pointing to what was going to occur. And he explains to them what was said in the scripture concerning himself. You see, our faith is not a faith that is just a blind faith. 
It, it is faith that is a solid faith. Someone many years ago gave me the acronym of MAPS, and it's M-A-P-S, and that the idea that, that Jesus calls us to commitment, but he gives us a map. <laughs> and the MAPS stand for manuscripts, and we don't have time to go into the, the, the overwhelming evidence of the reliability of the manuscripts that we have of the Gospels of Jesus, and how there's very little variation in what is different is just simply punctuation and it doesn't affect the meaning and, and, and the flow and how there is consistency within the manuscripts throughout history of what we have in terms of the life of Jesus. We can trust in the validity of the manuscripts that we have. That's the M. The A is archaeology. Oftentimes people will criticize the scripture because they will mention certain things that that history does not seem to, to, to follow. And yet there have been so many archaeological digs that they discover certain things and then they check it with the Bible and the Bible had it right the entire time. The P stands for prophecy. And if you were able to join us last week in person or on YouTube, we talked about the incredible prophecy. And this is just one in Daniel chapter nine, that several hundred years before Jesus entered into Jerusalem and what we call that first Palm Sunday, it was predicted down from the year to the month, to the week, to the day. It's impressive. And over the years, there is, there has been prophecy that has been fulfilled with a hundred percent Accuracy, And so the ones that have not been fulfilled yet, we can trust with 100% certainty. So we have the manuscripts, we have archaeology, we have prophecy, and the S is science. Sometimes we think that faith and science don't match up, but God is never afraid of science. There have been so many discoveries in science that actually point to the validity of what the scripture says. Science at times just needs to catch up to what the scripture says. So you put this all together, God gives us a map, doesn't he? He calls us to commitment, but it's never blind commitment. Our faith is not blind faith. It is faith based upon some very convincing evidence. And Jesus does call us to commitment. It's still faith because we can't think our way into heaven. That would be a work, obviously. It's still faith, but it's not blind faith. And Jesus reasons from the scripture to these two individuals. And we know this is a five hour journey. How long did Jesus allow them to express their feelings? How long did Jesus then explain the facts? We don't know the ratio there, but we know that he gave them facts. So now we have the feelings and now we have the facts. And Jesus comes and he addresses people where they are, doesn't leave them where they are, comes alongside of them because that's where they are. But then he gives them information for them to act on. And here's number three. Jesus accepted their invitation that led to their illumination. You see what we read here in verse 28. As they approached the village, and this is perhaps Luke saying, Okay, Theophilus, I've given you all this information. This is perhaps where you are. As they approached the village to where they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. So Jesus had come along, allowed them to express their feelings. He had come alongside them and give them explanation concerning the facts. Now it comes down to their faith. Will they take their faith and be a person who, who acts upon the facts? See, it's not enough just to know the facts. You have to act upon the facts. You have to act upon the evidence that is presented to you. So Jesus is he going to leave? Are they going to allow him to leave? But yet, what do, they, what do they do? They offer him an invitation to come in. You move from feelings to facts, and then you move to faith by allowing Jesus to enter. Verse 29, they urged him strongly, stay with us for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. And he went in to stay with them. So they offered Jesus an invitation that he did not decline. We also see they offer him a position of leadership within their home. He was at the table with them. He took bread. He is not just the guest that was invited, but now he's at the head of the table in a position of leadership. He is the host of this meal. He took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were open. 
You see, their eyes weren't open when Jesus was just allowing them to express their feelings. Their eyes were not open just when Jesus was presenting them the facts. They needed to invite Jesus in. They needed to give him a position of leadership. Jesus then allows them, I believe, to see the scars on his hands as he's distributing the bread to them. And it was at that moment that they saw. There's a verse in the scripture that I love. It's called, taste and see that the Lord is good. If you've ever had something that you've had to eat and then try to describe what that tastes like to someone else, it's really impossible. Unless a person tastes, you can't explain it to them. In fact, you come to this conclusion, everything just tastes like chicken, right? <laughs> you know, sort of the, the phrase. You must first taste, then you can see. It's not enough in terms of just venting to Jesus your feelings. It's not enough just a, a collection of some very admirable and convincing facts. There needs to be an invitation extended to Jesus to come in. There needs to be an invitation for him to, to be on the throne of your heart, to sit at the head of your table. Then you will taste and see. And there was an illumination there. Then their eyes were open, so what verse 31 says, and they saw him, and then he disappeared from their sight. And they asked each other, I love this verse, were not our hearts burning within us when he talked with us on the road and opened up the scriptures to them? You see, you see, the heart cannot embrace what the mind rejects. And so Jesus gives them this information but now because they accepted Jesus' leadership in their life and they invited him in, now their hearts are burning. You see, they already knew the truth before they acted on the truth. But when they acted on the truth, then their eyes were open. And finally, we see that Jesus gives them, this is number four, an inspiration that leads to declaration. We see that they got up after they saw Jesus for who he was and Jesus disappeared. They didn't stay there in Emmaus. They didn't stay there in their house. They do a 180. They go back from where they came from, which is Jerusalem. And there they found the 11, those with them, and they assembled together and saying that it is true, the Lord is risen and appeared to Simon and then the two told them what had happened along the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. You see, the logical progression is that when you meet the resurrected Jesus, you cannot keep silent. There was a declaration and an understanding of what being a follower of Jesus was. Jesus calls a group of disciples in the Gospels. He says, come and be fishers of men, followers, fish, disciples, disciple. I wonder where you are at in this particular journey. Are you at the stage where your hopes have been shattered? Perhaps even you accomplished what you set out to accomplish, thinking that it was going to fulfill you and make you happy. And maybe you even got it, but yet you realize that it's not fulfilling all your hopes. There's still something missing. Maybe you're at that stage where Jesus is going to come alongside you and just allow you to express what you feel. Maybe you're in that gathering stage where, where you want as much information as you possibly can, like Theophilus, right? As Luke is writing this gospel account to his friend, and really this Emmaus Road experience is really a summary of the journey of Theophilus. Theophilus was collecting information. Jesus will give you the information as long as you follow the information and not be apathetic and lazy. Most people don't get to that point. They just rather just vent. <laughs> Maybe you're at the, the phase where you have the information, you know it's true. You just need to invite Jesus to be the Lord and Savior and the leader of your life. If you do, you will taste and see that the Lord is good. Your eyes will be opened to something that you already knew. Perhaps you're in that last stage where you realize, yes, Jesus is the leader of my life. And I see him differently than I saw him before because I invited him in. And now I need to share this and I need to declare what he has done and who he is, that he has risen from the dead and he is my Lord. If you're in that stage, then, you know, in the following weeks, we're going to be talking about some very practical ways 
that you can share your story. Well, the Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. May his face shine upon you and give you strength. And wherever you are at along the road in your journey, I pray that Jesus will meet you where you are. I, I believe that Jesus will meet you exactly where you are. I believe that Jesus will give you what you need. I believe that Jesus will call you to commitment and how you invite him in is very easy. You just simply say, Lord, you are the son of God. You did die on the cross. You did rise from the dead. I believe this. I ask for forgiveness because without it, I am in big trouble. I invite you in to be the leader of my life. And then go and tell. Go and tell the simple story about how Jesus revealed himself to you. You tasted and you saw. Well, the Lord bless you. Have a great Resurrection Sunday.